Hi Steve, thanks for coming along. We've talked in the past about smart and intelligent buildings. Could you tell um, us about your role and what you do at Hassel? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Steve Costa. I'm a principal at Hassel and I'm also the leader of our workplace design and commercial buildings um, client sector at Hassel internationally. Great. Um, we've often hear a lot about intelligent buildings and what they mean to people and smart buildings and everyone's got different interpretations and I know you've talked to me about it before about your views on it um, between the difference between technical um, smart buildings and the people side of it could you give us give us your view on that yeah sure I mean I think intelligent buildings is one of those terms that has come to mean very different things to different people um, at Hassel, what we're particularly interested in is not just intelligent buildings, but emotionally intelligent buildings. Um, I, obviously, there's a lot of um, technical intelligence and, and technical engineering that goes into making these buildings work, and that's great. But what we would like to see is buildings that go beyond that and actually start to think about how people feel, what motivates and interests people and engages them, and how to create environments that let people um, be, be more effective people. So um, from our point of view, you know, this idea of emo an emotionally intelligent building would be a building that um, understands people's feelings and, um, and motivations and, and maximises those for the organisations that they work for. So you're talking about the people leading the, the building and leading the design and making it smart rather than the technology leading the people? Yeah, I think our experience and, and you know, the building industry in general is, is an interesting place where it tends to be thought about from a, from a technology, first, t technology yeah. perspective first and then a, and then a building um, perspective and then the people come along at the end and, and occupy the building. What we're really interested in is reversing that order of thinking and starting the whole process from the people point of view and thinking what are people trying to do um, what are they? Um, what 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 motivates the way they want to work in a building? And let's design the place and then the technology around that to support those people to do what they're trying to do anyway, and help them do it in a really natural way. And I know where we've talked about it before, and you know my views of th about things are trying to be simple and keep things simple. Yeah. Um, do you think that the technology may be complicated in the background, but the way it interfaces with people needs to be simple, or? or do you think it should be more complicated? No, we, I think we're definitely seeing that better buildings are getting more and more simple for people to use. And the technology and the innovation and the engineering in the background might be very complex, but the user experience of the building is getting easier and simpler, and people's expectations of things are that they get um, easier and simpler. So our, our experience is that the best buildings get out of the way. The best buildings move, move aside and let the people get to each other and let the people do what they're trying to do at the speed yeah. that they're trying to do it. So um, any engineering and, and technology that can help make that easy for people, that's a really intelligent building in my view. Yeah, okay. So some of the changes that are going on in the workplace now, how do you think they can be su um, supported by um, the way smart buildings are designed in the future? Well, we think that smart buildings are part of the, the leadership of the organisation. What I mean by that is that um, you know, we believe that the primary leadership role in organisations is about culture. It's about building and developing the right kind of culture to be the kind of organisation that you want to be. And smart organisations now are realising that buildings are part of that cultural leadership, that the, the kind of physical environment you create for yourselves is part of being the organisation that you say you're trying to be. So from our point of view, you know, a smart building taps into that and um, concentrates its efforts on helping people do more of the stuff that's aligned with the target culture and stops people from doing stuff that's not aligned. So a smart building um, yeah, is very conscious and very deliberate about um, helping people be, be better and helping the organisation work at its best. So it requires leadership from the senior membership of a company and the, 
to drive that change and that smart through into a building and realise how the building can affect that, like the building being a smart device? Yeah, that's certainly our experience is that the technical resolution of a project is not enough, that yeah. that, that technical um, resolution needs to be connected to the leadership of the organisation and where it's trying to go. Um, the way that people work together is, is or should be um, focused on where the organisation is trying to be in the future. And so that's, um, that's inherently something that's, that's out there and a bit uncertain and that needs people to lead other people towards that. But the physical environment can help you go there. Yeah. It can help you um, encourage people to come with you and, and expose, I suppose, a kind of cultural alignment amongst people in the organisation. And that's very much where we think the most powerful impact of buildings can, can be for organisations. Yeah. And um, I, I also think about different types of buildings. Everyone associates smart buildings with brand new buildings. Yeah. And yep. I know that you've worked with, with clients on heritage buildings. How do you think a heritage building works with um, smart buildings, intelligent buildings? Is it possible? What's your views on that, your experiences? Well, obviously we love designing brand new buildings um, and that creates all sorts of opportunities for doing things in, in new and innovative ways. But we also see um, that heritage buildings and old, old buildings and the reuse of buildings can be a very powerful thing for organisations, particularly in terms of the organisation's emotional intelligence and um, cultural alignment. And I think that's because... Um, people like to identify with you know, something that's authentic, something that has history, something that has a story, yeah. something that represents what the organisation believes in. And creating that from scratch in a new building is quite challenging. Um, and another way to go about it is, is use the inherent um, authenticity of older buildings to, to create something tangible that people like being a part of and a place that people like coming to. Um, people, have, people have a good sense for sort of fake environments. They don't like <laughs> fake environments. Yeah. And, and old buildings you know, aren't fake. They're real places with real histories that people like to be. So um, often um, organisations, or we find that organisations who are very focused on attracting people, especially creative people, um, use those heritage buildings to create an environment that, that's appealing to people and welcoming and comfortable for people. And at the end of the day, that's a big part of it because if people don't want to come and work in your workplace, they'll go and work somewhere else. So quite often in those types of bu buildings, from my experience in working with those types of projects, there is not often a automatic window or vent control system. Mm. It's quite often the person going over there and opening the window themselves. Mm. Um, and does that create... Um, issues for the occupants in it being a smart building and enabling people to be smart inside the building. Mm. Does or what's the feedback from the users from those types of buildings? Um, I think that the users aren't too fussed about what technology it is you use. Mm. To be honest, you know, um, the users want a certain sort of outcome. You know, people who work in buildings. Um, let's say it's about um, personally controlling their environment. They don't care how, they just care that they're able to do it. So yeah. it may be that that's um, provided by a, the, late, the very latest um, piece of technology, but it might just be a, window, a handle on a window that allows them to open the window. They're both providing that individual with the ability to, to control and change their environment, um, and they're, they're just different ways of, of doing that. So um, from our point of view, you know, I think sometimes the low tech, there's, there's something to be said for the low tech solution, um, people like things to be simple, and if you can solve something with a simple openable window, yeah. then maybe that's the easiest and, and most natural way to provide the person with that level of control. So the common theme again is simplicity. Make the interface simple. What's in the background can be complicated, but it needs to be simple. Yeah, that's right. And maybe what's simple for people is actually just really simple. Maybe things are over provided and over specified and over managed you know maybe if you need to be able to reconfigure a room rather than organizing it by technology through your facility management department maybe you should just be able to 
rearrange the room. Yep. And sometimes those very low tech solutions are actually the most natural and effective for people. And at the end of the day, as we've said, you know, that's the main game is how do you help people do their day, day jobs most effectively? Uh, if we don't need these management systems, let's not, let's not bother providing them. So have you got any views on what you would not want to see in an intelligent building or a smart building in 20 years time? Things that you would think are an absolute no-no that we should avoid? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, what you wouldn't want to see in a smart building 20 years from now would be a building that's um, too slow, that's too structured and um, too, um, creates too many separations between people. Um, in other words, what people will want in 20 years time are buildings that let them operate at the real speed of business without the building getting in the way. Um, some of that's about buildings, technology, uh, technological systems mm -hmm. and not, not having those things create barriers to doing business. But others of it is just about the, the, the physical spaces themselves and allowing people to work with each other more easily. Um, you know, it comes down to things like just really simple things like security layers in buildings, you know. Let's get rid of the old swipe in at every lift lobby. I mean, how are you supposed to do business with each other in an organisation when you can't get into each other's workspace? If you get the core out the way, get the security out the way and yeah. let people get to each other when they need to get to each other and find each other and come across one another and talk to each other and have ideas together, that's what buildings should do in the future. So that's removing technology, so moving the barriers to enable people to move effectively and quickly. Yeah. Well, that's as simple as putting a staircase inside the tenant space rather than on the outside of the tenant space. I think, I think it can be that simple. I think obviously sometimes there's going to be quite sophisticated technology in the background, but, mm. but the way that you and I have an idea together and turn that idea into reality for our business, that's, you know, that happens between you and I. It doesn't happen... Um, in its most primary you know, way. It doesn't happen via technology. It no. happens through a person-to-person -person, you know, interaction and relationship and how does the building facilitate those things. That's really what we mean by a building with emotional intelligence, not just the technical kit, yep. but, but a building that enables people to understand each other and empathise with each other and see opportunities together. How do we cater for the millennials as, as our workforce ages? Um, look, it's a really interesting question and it's a very topical one that seems to have had a lot of discussion. Um, I don't think that the answer is about designing specifically for different generations any more than it's designing for specific star signs. You know, um, I think that the issue is really about choice and about individuals' ability to choose how they work and to be provided with an environment that allows them to work however they happen to work most effectively, whether they're a Gen Y, a Gen Z or a baby boomer. All of those people are going to be equally valuable to organisations going forward, for, for perhaps for different reasons, but they're all yeah. part of the picture. And so the question is, how do you provide an environment where, where everyone can find a way to work that works for them? and yet connects them together under a common purpose and a common culture to be part of an organisation so that they want to belong um, to what it is that you're trying to do. Um, so some, some of the, some of the uh, building users, operators, people that lease buildings are changing, either from going from big to, big to small or small to big or um, cells within those companies are changing and breaking out. Mm -hmm. how, how, does the, how does a smart building evolve and accommodate those things? So I think this is a really interesting question about how organisations are changing and what that means for buildings. We've known for a long time that the only thing organisations know for sure is that they don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so we've had to design buildings to allow them to rearrange and change over time. But I think what's happening now is that even the nature of their workforce is potentially breaking down and that um, people won't have big stable organisations in the future the way we've had until now. It may be that from now on, you know, projects are just as easily resourced with um, a range of independent workers um, that mean you don't have to have a team at all um, within your organisation. So that provides quite different challenges for buildings and particularly the intelligent systems in buildings. I mean, how do you create a building that that supports a team that might not belong to your security system, for example. How do you invite um, 
your competitors to come in and work in your building as a collaborator when you choose to team up for a joint venture. These sort of dynamics, organisations are getting much more permeable, their boundaries are breaking down, and buildings are going to have to find a way to allow organisations to work in that way because it's, it's part of how we do business now. So the common themes that are coming out here again are simplicity, flexibility and adaptability mm. and making sure that the smart buildings that we design can do all of those things. They're quite generic terms but if you stand back that's what we're looking for and I think simplicity is the most important thing. It's come out in a lot that you said today and I think um, that's pretty um, common in most discussions that we have about smart intelligent buildings. Um, so I think it's something that we all need to focus on as an industry. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from you today on the people side of smart buildings and myself being an engineer I quite often focus on the technical side and it's been really good and refreshing to hear and readjustment for me around um, the people side. So thank you for your time and uh, really look forward to hearing some more views and us helping people in the industry bring the smart buildings together for the clients. Thanks Peter, it's a pleasure to, to be here and it's a great challenge to, to create these places together, so thanks for your time.